Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. This is Wardog Sec, and I'm back with another video for you guys. Today's video, we're going to continue on with the pre-security learning path. And apparently this room here is a part of the complete beginner path as well. These windows fundamentals room. So if you see that up here, remember we're still doing the pre-security. We're gonna wrap it up with the rest of these windows fundamentals rooms. Now, without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in. Task one, introduction to Windows. The Windows operating system OS is complex product with many system files, utilities, settings, features, etc. This module will attempt to provide a general overview of just a handful of what makes up the Windows OS, navigating the user interface, make changes to the system, etc. The content is aimed at those who wish to understand and use the Windows OS on a more comfortable level. Launch attached virtual machine. The virtual machine should open within your browser. I already have it open here. You can also RDP into it, which is remote desktop into it, using those credentials right there. And I'm just going to head click continue here to task number two. Windows Editions. The Windows operating system has a long history dating back to 1985, and currently it is the dominant operating system in both home use and corporate networks. Because of this, Windows has always been targeted by hackers and malware writers. Windows XP was a popular version of Windows and had a long-running Microsoft announced Windows Vista, which was a complete overhaul of the Windows operating system. Windows Vista was garbage, by the way. There were many issues with Windows Vista. It wasn't received well by Windows users, and it was quickly phased out. That's exactly right. Windows XP was around for a long time. All right. Then Windows 7 came out and took over that pretty much. When Microsoft announced the end-of-life date for Windows XP, many customers panicked. Corporations, hospitals, etc. scrambled and tested the next viable Windows version, which was Windows 7, against many other hardware and devices. The vendors had to work against the clock to ensure their products worked with Windows 7 for their customers. If they couldn't, their customers had to break their agreement and find another vendor that upgraded their products to work with Windows 7. It was a nightmare for many, and Microsoft took note of it. Windows 7, as quickly as it was released after was marked with an end of support date, Windows 8.x came and left, and it was short-lived like Vista. Yep, Windows 8 was crap as well. And then arrived Windows 10, which is the current Windows operating system version for desktop computers. Windows 10 comes in two flavors, Home and Pro. You can read the difference between the Home and Pro version here, so be sure to check that out if you're not familiar with it. Usually in a corporate environment, you're going to be working with Windows Pro or Enterprise Editions. Even though we didn't talk about servers, the current version of the Windows operating system for servers is Windows Server 2019. As you can see, this is a bit dated. The, the latest version of Windows Server is 2022, as of, um, or to my knowledge. Many critics like to bash on Microsoft, but... They have made long strides to improve the usability and security with each new version of Windows. The Windows Edition for the attached VM is Windows Server 2019 standard as seen in system information. As of June 2021, Microsoft announced the retirement dates for Windows 10 here. Microsoft will continue to support at least one 10 semi-annual until October 10, or 14, 2025. As of October 5th, 2021, Windows 11 is the current Windows operating system for end users. Read more about Windows 11 here, so be sure to familiarize yourself with that. So what encryption can you enable on Pro that you can't enable in Home? And I believe that is going to be BitLocker. There you go. Now let's continue on with task number three here, talking about the GUI. The Windows Desktop, aka the Graphical User Interface, or GUI, in short, is the screen that welcomes you once you log into a Windows 10 machine. Traditionally, you need to pass the login screen first. The login screen is where you need to enter valid Account credentials, usually a username and password or of a pre-existing Windows account on that particular system or in the Active Directory environment if it's a domain name or joined machine. The screenshot is an example of a typical Windows desktop. Each component that makes up the GUI is explained briefly below. You got the desktop here, which is the background. You got the start menu right here. And you got the search box here. I don't think Cortana is even used anymore today. Uh, Four is the task view, which is this little icon here, right? You can see it right there as well. It's a little bit bigger. Task number five is the task bar down here. Um, task number six is the toolbar right there. Let's talk about this here, apparently. So there you go. And then the seven is the notification area down here where you can see like the time and date and stuff like that. 
the desktop. The desktop is where you will have shortcuts to programs, folders, files, etc. These icons will either be well organized in folders uh, sorted alphabetically or scattered randomly with no specific organization on the desktop. In either case, these items can typically uh, be placed on the desktop for quick access. The look and feel of the desktop can be changed to suit your liking. By right-clicking anywhere on the desktop, a context menu will appear. This menu will allow you to change the sizes of the desktop icon specific or specify how you want to arrange them, copy paste items to the desktop and create new items such as a folder shortcut or a text document, right? So right-click here and it brings up this little sub menu. Under display settings, you can make changes to the screen's resolution and orientation. In case you have multiple computer screens, you can make configurations uh, to multiple screens set up here and there's an example right there All right you can go down here and do it this way i believe it's in settings somewhere All right i mean you can just type it in here let's see here display there you go display settings there you go and let's see here. note in remote desktop session some of the display settings will be disabled all right um, you can go personalized change the wallpaper if you want to and it just goes in you can go over and look at whatever wallpapers you want. So you can go ahead and try this out yourself. I'm just going to continue on here. The start menu. In previous versions of Windows, the word start was visible at the bottom left corner of the desktop GUI. In modern versions of Windows, such as Windows 10, the word start doesn't appear anymore. But rather, a Windows logo is shown instead. Even though the look of the start menu has changed, its overall purpose is the same. The start menu provides access to all the apps slash programs, files, utilities, uh, tools, etc that are most useful clicking on the windows logo and the start menu will open the start menu is broken up into sections see below here all right so you can go ahead and try that out yourself all right go ahead and click it and you look around here and let's talk about number one here which is i like to call the hamburger icon right this section of the start menu provides quick shortcuts to actions that you can perform with your account or login session such as making changes to your user account lock your screen or signing out of your account other shortcuts specify or shortcuts specific to your account are your documents document icon folder pictures lastly gear cog icon will take you to settings power icon let you disconnect from remote desktop session, shut down the computer, restart the computer. Any below image, you can see each of the icons present. Um, to expand the section, click on the icon that resembles a hamburger at the top, right, which I just said. So there you go. And let's see here. This section, number two, uh, recently added programs, apps at the top, and all the installed apps programs that are configured to appear in the start menu. In this section, you'll also see the app slash programs will be listed in alphabetical order. Each letter will have its own section. See below. All right. And let's see here. All right, there we go here. Okay, let's see. And above image, the first box is where the recently added uh, programs, apps will appear. The second box is where the installed apps programs will appear. In your VM, Google Chrome will not show up as recently added program anymore. If you have a long list of installed apps programs, you can jump to a particular section in the list by clicking on the letter of the headings in the grid see below. All right, that's good to know. It says the white letters match uh, the letter headings, the right side of the start menu. So we will find icons, specific apps, programs, or utilities. These icons are known as tiles. So tiles are added to this section by default. If you right click on any of these tiles, you guessed it, the menu will appear. You can do various different actions here. As you can see there, they have them listed out. So right click here, and there you go. See, more stuff here. Um, apps slash programs can be added to the start menu section by right clicking the app slash program and selecting pin to start menu. All right, so you can go here, and all right, let's just pin this PowerShell. Oh, it's already pinned, so you can just unpin it here. And if you go down here, right there, and you can repin it, pin the start. There you go. Let's see here. The task bar. Some of the components are enabled and visible by default. The toolbar, number six, for example, was enabled for demonstration purposes. If you'd like to, or like me, and want to disable some of these components, you can right click on the task bar to bring up the, ta the context. All right, so let's go ahead and do that here. Oops, so I clicked the wrong thing. There we go. So you can go here and Mess around with stuff here, play around with it if you want to, taskbar settings, stuff like that. There you go. 
just continue on here. Any app slash program, folders, file, server, you can open, start, will appear in the task bar, right? You can also pin these to the task bar too. So see, pin the task bar, now it's down there. Hovering over the icon will provide a preview thumbnail along with a tool tip. This tool tip is handy if you have many apps, programs open, such as Google Chrome, and you wish to find which instance of Google Chrome is the one you need to bring to focus. When you close any of these um, items, they will disappear from the taskbar unless you explicitly pinned it to the taskbar. The notification area. The notification area, which is typically located at the bottom right of the window screen, is where the date, time, are displayed. Other icons possibly visible in this area. Uh, you get the volume icon, network, wireless icon, to name a few. Icons can be either added or removed from the notification area in the taskbar settings. All right, so go ahead and try to play around with this here. Let's continue on. Here are Microsoft's brief documents for the start menu notification area. Tip, you can right click any folder file app program icon to view more information or perform actions clicked on them, right? So you can do this, you can do all, all kinds of stuff. I'm sure that's what, what they're uh, talking about here. And let's see, which selection will hide disable the search box? Which selection will hide disable the task view button? Besides clock and network, what other icon is visible in the notification area? All right, so be sure to answer these questions and then come back to the video and we will continue on. Hey everybody, just a quick little blurb here. As you can see here, most people that view my channel are not subscribers. If you're new here, please consider subscribing to the channel. If you're enjoying the video, please consider hitting the like button. It helps get me in the algorithm, helps spread the good word out there helps bring more people and increase our glorious community here. All right, I'm all about helping out others. I know what it's like to come up in cybersecurity or even try to get into cybersecurity and not knowing where to look. I'm just having this channel up so I can help out other people. All right, that's all I got. All right, hopefully you were an answering these questions. Now let's go ahead and find these real quick. The first question was, which selection will hide slash disable the search box? Well, right click in the task bar below here and let's take a look you go to the search over here and you s it says hidden so you can click that and now it's, notice how it's gone and you go back in here same thing and it should bring it back Oop, yeah show icon so there you go uh, the next one says which selection will hide slash disable the task view button you go back in here again and it says show task view button just click it see now it's gone go back in and it's there. The last one here says, besides the clock and network, what other icon is visible in the notification area? Notification area is down here in the, in the bottom right. See, no, no, no new notifications. If you right click that, it should bring up a menu. It should be the action center. Right? As soon as you right click on it, if I can do it here. Let's see, there we go, open action center. There you go. Now let's continue on to task number four. And we're going to talk about the file system. The file system used in modern versions of Windows is the new technology file system, or NTFS for short. Before NTFS, there was FAT16 and FAT32 file allocation table in HPFS, high performance file system. You still see FAT partitions in use today. For example, you typically see FAT partitions in USB devices, micro SD cards, etc. But traditionally, not on personal Windows computers slash laptops or Windows servers. NTFS is known as journaling file system. In case of a failure, the file system can automatically repair the folder slash files on disk using information stored in a log file. This function is not possible with FAT. NTFS addresses many of the limitations of the previous file system, such as support files larger than four gigabytes, set specific permissions on folders and files, folder and file um, compression, encryption, encryption file system, or EFS. If you're running Windows, what is the file system your Windows um, installation is using? You can check the properties, right click on the drive your operating system is installed on, typically the C drive. So if you go ahead and do that, go ahead and open up the file explorer here and you go down to this PC and you go to, it says local disk and you can go to properties here, right? And you can go through and see that it says file system NTFS. 
you can read Microsoft's official documentation on each of those click in here so you should check that out if you're interested let's speak briefly on some features that are specific to NTFS on NTFS volumes you can set permissions that grant or deny access to files and folders. The permissions are full control, modify, read and execute, list folder contents, read and write. And there's a little table here, it has it all listed out here. The below image lists the meaning of each permission on how it applies to a file in the folder. So be sure to read all through this here. How can you view the permissions on a, a folder or a file? All right, basically you just go in here and you can you can right click it and then go to uh, properties and you go to security. All right, and you can see stuff here in advanced. No, it's not advanced sharing. Um, sorry, there you go. Security and you can see things in here. Right, allow, deny, stuff like that. Go in, you can edit the permissions for it, add, remove, all that stuff. Refer to the Microsoft documentation to get a better understanding of NTFS permissions for special permissions. Another feature of NTFS is alternate data streams, ADS. ADS is a file attribute specific to Windows NTFS, new technology, file system. Every file has at least one data stream, dollar sign data, and ADS allows files to contain more than one stream of data. Natively, Windows Explorer doesn't display ADS to the user. There are third-party executables that can be used to view this data. But PowerShell gives you the ability to view ADS for files. If you don't know what PowerShell is, be sure to click this and learn about it. From a security perspective, malware writers have used ADS to hide data. Not all its uses are malicious. For example, when you download a file from the internet, there are identifiers written to ADS to identify that the file was downloaded from the internet. To learn more about ADS, refer to the following link from malware bikes here so be sure to click this and learn about it bonus if you wish to interact with hands-on uh, ads um, i suggest exploring day 21 of advent of cyber 2 so be sure to check that out if you're interested and ntfs what does it stand for well it stands for new technology uh, file system so copy and paste and we're going to continue on to the next uh, task here there we go and let's take a look at task number five the windows slash system 32 folders the Windows folder C Windows is traditionally known as the folder which contains the Windows operating system. The folder doesn't have to reside in C drive necessarily. It can reside on any other drive and typically can reside in a different folder. This is where environment variables, more specifically system variables, um, come into play. Even though not discussed yet, the system environment variable for this Windows directory is percentage winder percentage per microsoft environment variables store information about the operating system environment this information includes details such as the operating system path the number of processors used by the operating system and the location of temporary folders there are many folders within the windows folder see below right so you can go in and check it out yourself as well let me get out all of this here right so we go to c and the windows you can see all kinds of stuff in here All right, many folders see system 32, right? So you, if you scroll down here, you should be able to see it there, system 32, right? It's a bunch of stuff in here. System 32 folder holds the important files that are critical for the operating system. You should proceed with extreme caution when interacting with this folder. Accidentally deleting any files or folders within system 32 can render the Windows OS inoperable. Read more about this action here, so be sure to check this out. Many of the tools that will be covered in the Windows Fundamental Series reside within the Windows or the System32 folder. What is the variable for the Windows uh, folder? So if you scroll back up here, you can find that out. And it was this here. So we're going to copy and paste. There we go. Now let's continue on to task number six and see what they're working with here. Task number six, user accounts, profiles, and permissions. User accounts can be one of two types on a typical local Windows system, administrator and standard user. The user account type will determine what actions the user can perform on that specific Windows system. An administrator can make changes to the system, add users, delete users, modify groups, modify settings on the system, etc. A standard user can only make changes to folders slash files attributed to the user and can't perform system level changes such as install programs. You are currently logged in as an administrator. There are several ways to determine which user account exists on the system. One way is to click the start menu in the type 
other user and system settings other users so go ahead and try this out yourself and and see what they have all right or you can just do it you just do it like this you can type in other users like it says here other users there you go add users remove edits etc so there you go local account and since you're an administrator you can see add anyone else to this pc a standard user will not see this option click on the local user count change the type you know remove it stuff like that uh, click on the change account account uh, account type and you can see options here right standard user administrator and let's see when a user account is created a profile is created for the user the location for each user profile folder will fall under the c users for example the uh, user profile folder for the user account max will be c users max the creation of the user profile is done upon initial login when a user or new user account logs into a local system for the first time they'll see several messages on the login screen one of the messages uh, user profile service sits on the login screen for a while which is at work creating the user profile see below please wait right I'm sure you guys have seen this before. Once logged in, the user will see a dialog box similar to the one below, indicating that their profile is in creation. Each user profile will have the same folders. A few of them are below, desktop to documents, uh, downloads, music. So if you go back into File Explorer here, and let me close out of some of this stuff. Anyway, all right, you go to C, uh, yeah, C, and then you got users here. You can see stuff in administrator, public. Try hacking Billy, right? And you got the same folders in here, or yeah, same folders. Another way to access the information, and then some, is using local users and group management. So if you go down here, you can just type it in. I mean, so if you type in groups, I believe, nope, maybe local group. There we go. Nope. All right, because you can't do it that way. Well, all right, let's just follow along here. If you go in here and you type in run. Let me close this stuff out and see. All right, now you can see the users in here. You can go to groups and see using what. Let's check the local admins group and only this administrator account is in there. All right, note the run dialog box opens items quickly. Back to um, LUSRMGR, however you pronounce that, you'll see two folders, users and groups, which I've already shown below. If you click on the groups, you can see all the names, which you've already done. Each group has permission set to it and users are assigned, added to groups by the administrator. When the user is assigned to a group, the user inherits the permissions of that group. A user can be assigned to multiple groups. Note, if you click on the add someone else to this PC, other users, it will open local users and group management. What is the name of the other user account in here? So if we go back and check, it was this try hack me Billy. So go ahead and type that in here. Try hack me Billy. There we go. What groups is the name or is the user a member of? So let's go ahead and see. I don't think you can check it through this way. Nope. So let's go back and see. Maybe. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. Member of remote desktop users. All right. And then also the users group. So let's do it. type this in as well. There we go. What built-in account is for guest access to the computer? All right. So let's go ahead and, and see here. Well, it's going to be guest. So there we go. It says it right here under description, built in guest account. And you can see that there seems to be a password in the description section of uh, Trihack Ability. Make sure not to do that, folks. That's bad uh, security practices there. What is the account status? And it says it's disabled. So let's see here. Properties. And let's see. Let's see what they're uh, actually looking for here. Um, yeah, so uh, 
I guess you got they want account is disabled. The whole thing in there, okay. Is disabled. There we go. And task number seven here. User account control. The large majority of home users are logged into their Windows systems as local administrators. Remember from the previous task that any user with administrator as the account type can make changes to the system. A user doesn't need to run with high elevated privileges on the system to run tasks that don't require such activities or privileges, such as surfing the internet, working on a Word document, etc. This elevated privilege increases the risk of system compromise because it makes it easier for malware to infect the system. Consequently, since the user account can make changes to the system, the malware would run in the context of the login user. I love local admins. If I'm a pen te penetration tester or red teamer, I love seeing accounts that are local admins on the box. All right, it makes my job a lot easier to protect the local user, which or with such privileges, Microsoft introduced user account control, also known as UAC. This concept was first introduced with the short-lived Windows Vista and continued with versions of Windows that followed. UAC by default doesn't apply by the built-in uh, local administrator account. How does it work? When a user with an account type of administrator logs to the system, the current session doesn't run with elevated permissions. When an operation requiring higher level privileges needs to execute, the user will be prompted to confirm if they permit this operation to run. Let's look at the program on the account you're currently logged into. The built-in administrator account, right-click and view its properties. All right. So you, if you go here and right click and view property, oh, they want us to look at uh, CrowdStrike, or uh, sorry, Wireshark here. So let's go ahead and do that. Take a look. You can see uh, security tab here. You can see the permissions of each little account has here. So I can do pretty much anything. I just notice that the standard user is not listed. Log in as a standard user and try to install this program to do this you can remote desktop into the machine as a standard uh, user account you have the user name and password for the standard user is visible if you go and look here before installing the program notice the icon do you see the difference when you've logged in as a standard user the shield icon is on the program's default icon screen below let's see here so go ahead and try this out all right you can rdp to this box here through the attacker box here right as it stated in the uh, room earlier so go ahead and try that out if you're interested and you're going to see an icon looks like this and as you, if you try to run this program basically this usc prompt is going to come up you're going to need to know the administrator password and um, username uh, after some time if the password is not entered the usc prompt disappears and the program does not install this feature reduces the likelihood of malware successfully compromising your system you can read more about usc here so be sure to check that out and this is, let's um, go back up here and see what UIC was. Remember, it's user access control. So let's go ahead and copy and paste this and then continue on to the next task. All right, there we go. Now task number eight here. And we're going to be talking, we're going to be talking about uh, settings and the control panel. On a Windows system, the primary locations to make changes are the settings menu and the control panel. For a long time, the control panel has been the go-to location to make system changes such as adding a printer, uninstall a program, etc. The settings menu was introduced in Windows 8. The first Windows operating system catered to touchscreen tablets and is still available in Windows 10. As a matter of fact, the settings menu is now the primary location a user goes to if they are looking to change the system. There are similarities and differences between the two menus. Below are screenshots of each. See, you can see the settings area here. And you can take a look at it yourself. All right, if you just go here and you can type in settings. All right, or not. You just click this little gear icon. I'll bring it up and get out of this here. All right, go to home. There you go. Windows uh, settings. They got control panel stuff. You can type it in here as well. Control panel. Let's see. Control panel. There you go. And it'll bring up the control panel stuff. Note the icons for the settings might be different in the versions of Windows on your personal device. Both can be accessed from the start menu. So go ahead and try that if you haven't done so already. It goes and talks about network settings. Okay. You can go ahead, go down here, and you can right click on the little computer icon, monitor icon, and you go to open network and settings you can get to it that way 
You can go to change adapter settings to bring up the actual uh, NIC card settings here. You can get into here, you right click, you can go to properties, see all kinds of stuff, right? After you get in here, you can go and look around. You can go to this um, Internet Protocol version 4. You go to properties here, you can go in and see what is configured and such. So let's go ahead and continue on here. And it's just telling you, you can go back to control panel through that way. And let's go ahead and skip through some of this here. All right, so questions. And control panel, change the view to small icons. What is the last setting in the control panel view? So let's go ahead and close out of this stuff here. And go back to control panel, all right? Change the, change the view. So let's see here, small icons. And it says, what is the last setting in the control panel view? And it should be this Windows Defender Firewall. So let's go and type that in here. Windows Defender Firewall. There we go. Now let's go ahead and talk about Task Manager for task number nine. Task Manager is awesome. It'll come and save the day sometimes when applications don't want to work right. Let's see here. The last subject that will be touched on in this module is the task manager. The task manager provides information about the applications and processes currently running on the system. Other information is also available, such as how CPU, RAM are being utilized, which falls under performance. You can access the task manager by right-clicking the task bar. So let's go ahead and do that. You can do, the, do that and then uh, task manager as so. And you go to more details down here, it'll bring up more details. All right, task manager come up, simple view won't show much information, more details. And it says you can refer to this blog for more detailed information about task manager. So check that out if you're not familiar with task manager. Get familiarized with it because if not, then you won't be able to learn its capabilities and what it can do. If you wish to learn about the core Windows processes and what each process is responsible for, visit the core Windows process room. So be sure to check that out if you're interested. What is the keyboard shortcut to open task manager? And let's see what that is. The keyboard shortcut. You probably have to go and check the, check it out here. But I am just going to Google it and see what they say. Let's see here. All right. Now let's see what Google has to say. Control Shift um, Escape. Let's see if that's what they're looking for. Control plus Shift plus the escape. There we go. Now task number 10 for the conclusion. Again, this was a generic overview of the Windows OS. There are intermediate and advanced topics for each task that was covered in this room. Hence, task nine ended with a detailed blog post explaining the task manager in great detail. And future modules will cover topics like the Windows folder, the management console, security tools, such as Windows Defender, Windows Firewall, etc. To name a few, read above and terminate the Windows machine you deployed in this room. All right, folks, that wraps it up. Hopefully, you had a good time, you enjoyed yourself, you found this video to be informational, educational. And if you did, please consider hitting that subscribe button with the notification bell. If you're new here, hit the like button if you enjoyed it. Hit the comment section on your thoughts and opinions on the information shared in the video. And as always, thank you for watching, and I will see you later. Have a good one.